why do you drive? Well, duh, to get to where I need to go, you might be saying. And you're right in saying that. But let me ask you, why are you driving what you're driving? There might be a hand-me-down, sure. But let's go off the assumption that you chose and bought what you are driving right now. Again, there's caveats. It might be all you could afford. But why did you choose that car? If I were to put these three cars in front of you like it was the first car you could pick in a racing game, which would you pick and why was it the Integra? You see, even with, and it hurts me to say, a lower budget these days of 10k, there are still a decent amount of options out there. That doesn't mean all of them are good, and it sucks that half of these options were half the price they are now, like less than five years ago. But why do you, as someone who chose to click on and watch this video, drive the car that you do? I want you to think about it, and we'll come back to this a little bit later. But for now, I had another question for you. Have you ever been to an arcade? If the answer is yes, then just like me, you are probably one of those people that unknowingly do know this very niche racing series, Wangan Midnight. Right, I didn't even know that I'd ever heard of this series until someone pointed it out in the comments of my initial D video. This was that game that was in the corner of the arcade that was A, badass as all hell and always had a full stack of people there so you probably could never get a turn unless you happened to be there at a really good time, which is because it was also B, very great value for money where you could, you know, chuck a $2 coin in and as long as you keep winning, you could keep playing. Or at least that's how it was when I last played it quite a few years ago. So you could sit there on that $2 for ages as long as you were good enough. And if you had the big boy money, you could go to a separate machine tucked away even further to the side where you could actually customize your own car and import that into the game. But the one thing I didn't expect was for this game to actually have its very own manga and anime adaptation. And something I completely didn't expect was for it to actually be really good. If Initial D was the popular main character that every car enthusiast so happens to know about, Wangan Midnight would be like the really underappreciated but badass side character, say someone like Piccolo. Because like if you say Dragon Ball, he isn't the first thing that pops into your head, but he's undisputedly one of the goats. But the thing is, I think I could almost say that I actually liked Wong on Midnight more than I liked Initial D as a whole. Now I don't think I could definitively say one series is better than the other because they both offer completely different things. So really it all boils down to what's important for you. Initial D is centered around drifting and starts with some slice of life stuff and high school stuff and inevitably leans extremely far into just drifting and racing by the end. Whereas Wong on Midnight centers around highway racing on the Wangan, and it leans far more into the mechanical side of things, with cars being rebuilt a lot and heaps of like tuna, mumbo jumbo and heaps of things that people who aren't actually car enthusiasts and are just anime fans would not give two single shits about. It's definitely a show that's made by car enthusiasts for car enthusiasts more than it is a general form of entertainment that Initial D definitely fits far better. However, with that being said, it still does stay a lot more slice of lifey than something like Initial D does towards the end where it loses that. And it offers a far more realistic perspective of the journey of a car enthusiast from so many different angles. So much so that I think no matter who you are, you will find at least one, if not multiple characters that you'll be able to relate to. I love that we get to see so many different perspectives in this series and the main reason for that is because our main character isn't actually our protagonist. I know it sounds a bit weird, but hear me out. The MC who we follow in the beginning is Akio Asakura, a kid who's about to turn 18 but has to repeat a year and ends up just flunking out of high school because he just does not care. All he wants to do 
his work, he has multiple part-time jobs, all so that he can get some money to pay for his real passion, which is cars. We also get introduced to two other key characters early on. One is Tatsuya Shima, a doctor and the driver of a black Porsche 911 dubbed Blackbird, who's currently the king of the Wangan. And then we also have Reina Akikawa, a model slash late night TV host that drives an R32 GTR and finds most of her late nights on the Wangan. Our plot typically revolves around these three and no matter what, it always tends to come back to them, but none of them are the protagonist of this story. You see, I could actually make an argument for two separate protagonists in this story that aren't stereotypical characters per se. And if you want, you can let me know in the comments which you like better. While you're down there, feel free to subscribe. First and foremost, we have the one and only S30 Fair Lady Devil Z. This blue Datsun has quite the history behind it and it's been ran through more than your average Sylvia on Facebook Marketplace with a one, two, three, four, I know what I've got, send me an offer price tag attached to it. Its history gets so dark that some of its previous owners have died driving this car. And people thought it was so dangerous that it was left at a junkyard with a request, no, not even a request, a friggin' plead to not sell it off to anyone else and just scrap it. Of course, that doesn't hold up because the scrapyard would never pass an opportunity to sell some scrap and Akio ends up with the S30. And after restoring it for the first 10 or so episodes, it actually lives up to its reputation, crashing over and over again and being rebuilt each and every time by Akio until he gets some help later on, but we'll get there. All you need to know for now is that everyone thinks there's something special about this car and the way that Akio tames this beast is essentially just by being stubborn. He takes all the blame on himself for every single crash and fixes the car every single time without fail. He doesn't leave it. All because this Z calls to him in some way. And it's one of those cars that clearly just wants to be driven and driven hard. What's more important than any of that though, and what really sets this car apart from every other in the series is the way that it draws people in. The Devil Z has a history, a reputation, and a sheer presence on the Wangan. It ends up being like one giant racing magnet that car enthusiasts cannot help but be enthralled by. It puts a spell on each and every character we meet and really gives us a peek inside their lives and their motivations, and I love that. This is also a really nice twist of irony that I really appreciate because at first, everyone refers to this car as the devil and considers it as such because of all the lives it's taken. But in reality, the only devilish thing about it is the way other people lust after it. But we'll get more into that when we delve into our characters a little later. The other candidate for protagonist of Wangan Midnight is none other than the Wangan itself. Kind of like how some people might say that Night City is the protagonist of Cyberpunk 2077. This 62 km highway connecting Yokohama to Tokyo is the single converging point for every single character in this story. And the perfect place to clock over 300 km per hour. In fiction, of course. I'm sure nobody would actually be breaking the law. That is, unless you were a Japanese street racer during the 80s. That's right, not only is this our main setting that like 90% of the anime takes place in, it's also a highway with plenty of real life history that went to inspire Wang on Midnight in the first place. You see, in the 80s, a group of racers who were less of a fan of drifting and toge runs and more of a fan of pushing cars to their limits in other ways, took it upon themselves to hold the mantle of the fastest in Japan. This group was dubbed Midnight. They were extremely exclusive and to join, you had to meet some pretty crazy criteria. First off, you needed a car capable of getting up to 250 kilometers per hour back in the 80s, and you needed to be able to drive it comfortably at and well above that. There was also this whole apprentice system where you needed to actually attend every single meet for a solid year to even be considered one of them. And it's cool to actually read up on how these guys went about organizing meets 
back in the 80s before you know mobile phones were common and the internet they'd put secret messages inside newspaper adverts that would say things like for sale small handbags at discount prices for more information i am available for meetup at daikoku parking area on thursday between 11 pm and 2 am as an apprentice you'd obviously need to be looking out for and seeing these so you could attend every single meet me personally i'd probably missed the first damn meet because I am not attentive enough to pick up what they're putting down. Because of these strict rules, Midnight typically maxed out at around 30 members, so everyone in the crew knew each other. And from what I've read, they really did not like poses. Anyone who tried to rep a Midnight decal on their car that wasn't a member of the group typically wound up with their car getting trashed. This could have been for a number of reasons, but from what I've read, it seems to be most likely due to them not wanting to be associated with the wrong kinds of people. While yes, of course, they were breaking the law, as far as I can tell from reading up on them, these guys had a pretty strict moral compass, with one of their key pillars being to not fuck around when there's civilians about. So you can imagine if someone repping their decal was swerving through traffic, driving like a dickhead during broad daylight, or even worse, causing an accident, it'd be a pretty damn bad look. So for over a decade, they raced, set records, were untouchable by cops at the time who had their cars limited to 170 kilometers per hour, and most of all, upheld their values. Until 1999, where a local biker group decided they wanted to pick a race with two of the Wind Knight members, leading the race into a high traffic area, resulting in a collision killing two of the biker members and hospitalizing six civilians. After this incident, the club was immediately disbanded, with most of the cars featured in the club being locked away or even destroyed. And all of the ex-members have quietly just gone about their lives, never to really discuss the group again. You see, these guys were tight-knit and anonymous. They would only ever refer to each other by a first name. And typically, they were pretty high-profile people as far as we're aware. Because, I mean, come on. Who else would have had enough money to afford, first of all, the cars these guys were pumping out, let alone the mods that were going into them? They were rocking heavily modified imports like 911s and Testarossas, as well as Japanese domestic vehicles like GTRs, RX-7s, and 300ZXs. Some of these cars even had millions of dollars put under the hood. Midnight's goal, the reason all of them drove was to push their car to the limit and be the fastest in Japan. Why do you? There is one final thing I wanna mention about Midnight as it relates to the Wangan Midnight anime, but we'll get to it a little bit later when it's relevant. For now, We've established the premise of this story, our key characters will follow through to the end, and I've outlined the two prospects for protagonists of this series. The Devil Z that entrances everyone in this story, and the Wangan Highway itself, the outlet and convergence for every single character in this story that has its very own long and real history behind it. So how does our story actually progress? Well. It's not in a very traditional way. A key theme throughout this series is rebirth, or reigniting a previous passion you might have had lying dormant for quite some time, which is something that near each and every character goes through and is one of the most relatable parts of this whole series. Take Ishida. He's a high profile photographer that drives a Testarossa, he's got all the money in the world, his dream career and his dream car, but he's stagnant. Driving just doesn't feel the same as it used to. The novelty of becoming successful has worn off on him. That is, until he is passed by the Devil Z. And then he's hooked. Chasing that car makes him feel alive again and he becomes tunnel visioned on finding any way possible to pass it. So much so that he goes and seeks out the original tuner that built this Devil Z in the first place, Jun Kitami, also known as the tuner from hell. Kitami also goes through his very own rebirth. He's long retired from tuning cars, but as soon as he hears that his old Z is out there wandering the Wangan once again, he's reinvigorated. He decides to start tuning again, but he doesn't want to work on the Z. Instead, he's happy to work on Ishida's Testarossa. For a hundred grand, that is. 
and after he builds it, he can happily duke it out with the Z on the long gun. Essentially, the guy's got an ego and he wants to see if he can outdo himself with a fancier sports car and a much higher budget than he used to have. At this same time, the Z is going through its very own rebirth. Akio knows there's something off about it, but doesn't really have any idea what it is. So in an effort to find that out and learn about this car from the inside out, he decides he's going to do a complete overhaul by himself without YouTube tutorials. This guy is insane. And so it becomes Tuna from Hell versus Tuna from High School. We get a test run where the Testarossa spins out at 300 and we also get a scene where Tatsuya, Blackbird's driver, tries to enlist Kitami's help to tune it and beat the Z, all leading up to the penultimate race of these three cars. That is actually just skipped in the anime. That's right, we've got the infamous Wangan Midnight Episode 7 skip. I call it that because it makes just as much sense and leaves you just as disorientated as a typical video game skip would. Because out of nowhere, all you start to see is a brand new character you've never seen before, as well as random flashbacks of the Z being in a crash. Luckily for you though, I read the manga, so I can fill you in. Chapter 24 through 28 is this race we've been waiting for. And in this race, the Z crashes to save Blackbird and the Testarossa from a truck. Ishida admits defeat and swiftly exits the series after letting Tatsuya, Blackbird's driver, perform the surgery he requires to save his life. This is something that wasn't really explored in the anime. We were kind of led to believe he went in the hospital for like a health scare not because he was potentially going to die, but no, he was actually going to die and left the hospital early as advised by literally no one, but he wanted to have one last race and he didn't care if he lived or died at that point. There was also a whole other aspect of his character that was skipped in the anime. Essentially, it was his relationship with his father who worked really hard and ended up hospitalizing himself because he worked so hard to support his son and was too stubborn to ever go to the hospital and take care of himself. And for the longest time, he resented his father for that and wanted to be the complete opposite of him. Rather than working hard and saving money, he worked hard and played hard. He did everything literally pole opposite to his father just because he resented him for dying essentially when he didn't have to if he got help earlier. And ironically, he goes down the same path. This whole time he resented him and he didn't want to do the same thing as his father. And yet he does. And he ends up in the hospital neglecting his health for nearly the same reason. So then we get a surgery scene and it's pretty much cut there. We're really left in the dark on whether he lives or dies all the way up until chapter 123, where he actually makes a cameo. And Raina sees him and is perplexed as we are because she also thought he had died all the way back then as literally no one had seen him. And at this point in the series is where we start to look at different characters, which is why we're looking from the perspective of a random guy during episode 7. This guy is Koichi, a 28 year old mechanic who is expecting a baby with his wife and the not so distant future. And he's another prime example of rebirth in this series with a caveat. Koichi used to race until a couple of years back, where he sold his car and went clean off it. He's basically a gambling addict, but in this instance, cars and racing was his vice. At one point, his racing put him and his wife into debt. He was coming home late every single night. It got to a point that was so bad where she even had to pick up a late night labor intensive job so that they could keep up with their bills. And in doing so, unfortunately suffered a miscarriage of what would have been their first child. So he swore to never race again. It was the responsible thing to do. Since he stopped, the couple have saved up a sizable 4 million yen and he might just be able to live out his dream of finally moving out of the city to somewhere a bit more rural and opening up his own workshop. But the empty shell of the Devil Z lures him back into his old ways and he throws it all away. Now, not to justify his actions in any way, shape or form, cause like, come on man, nobody should be leaving their pregnant wife to go out and street race. But on a fundamental level, I kinda get how he feels and we will touch more on that later with a different character. 
but for now I'm talking less of the lying to my wife, but more in the sense of being depressed in not having a car that you can really enjoy driving. But I mean, trading my wife in for a GTR like he did, nah, just kidding. We aren't the I hate my wife generation. I love it a bit, wouldn't trade it for the world. But I mean... Now, in the meantime, there's a Repair the Z arc going on in the background where we're introduced to a bodywork specialist, Takagi. And I just love all these old guys rekindling their love from cars like the old days. I like to think of them as like the embodiment of the former members of Midnight many years later. Not racing themselves anymore, but instead opening up shops to still tune cars and stay in that world. And so the Z is restored. Koichi's R32 is running perfectly and it's finally time to race. And this race is easily one of the best in the series. The combination of the music, the tension, the emotions, it's such a perfect balance. And to top it off, the conclusion is just chef's fucking kiss. Because in the end, we've got our caveat. Koichi decides to give up after trying to race, but while he's doing so, realizing the only thing actually on his mind was his newly born child he isn't even there for. So he chose to let it go and give up on chasing the Z. Because there is no eternal winner, there is no closure, he would just forever be chasing. And out of all people, Kitami respects that by saying he thinks the guy made the right choice. So he goes back to his family and I really like this arc. Because while yes, he was reinvigorated for a time, and maybe the stress and pressure and responsibility of having a baby pushed him to do something a little bit stupid, at the very least he reconciled and realized that there are more important things in his life now. Which means instead, he needs to find a balance between his passion for cars and his family now, rather than just going all in on one or the other. Koichi drove to escape. In doing so, realized he left behind everything he held dear. Why do you drive? Koichi was the first, but won't be the last character to go through a similar journey with different flavors, which is why I said that this series has that recurring theme of rebirth and will more than likely have at least one character you come to relate to. We get an arc with a kid named Kay, a racer whose father used to race, who unfortunately passed away in a freak accident at just 50 kilometers per hour. He ended up following his dad's footsteps, so much so he's doing the same job as he used to and also racing like he used to. Three of our current day mechanics, Yamamoto, Kitami and Takagi, amongst a whole group of other oldies that used to race back in the day, find out that their old friend's son is racing and decide that they're gonna help him to build the greatest and fastest Supra that has ever stepped tire on the Wanga. They're doing it as a tribute of sorts, and self-admittedly, they just want to see if they can all come together and build a car that'll beat the Z. It's always kind of an ego thing with these guys, whether they like to admit it or not. Now Kei is coming from a different perspective to someone like Koichi. He's still a bit younger and fully involved in the racing scene, and doesn't necessarily want out of it either. But he's at that age where a lot of his friends are selling off their cars and just stop caring about the automotive world as a whole. It's a harsh reality that a lot of people can probably relate to. I went through it. Hell, both me and my best mate went through the exact same journey. We sold off for just stop caring about cars entirely after leaving high school and getting into full-time work. We're now at a stage where we're a little bit more responsible, I guess, buying homes with our partners. I got married last year, he's looking at getting married this year. But for me, after I got married is the point in which I finally got back into another fun car when I bought my ISF, which I did compromise a little on, so it would be something kind of comfortable for when I have kids. But now I'm just waiting for him to join me again and we talk about it a lot and he's clearly itching to buy something. <laughs> you see, I don't think you ever truly grow out of cars and if you do, you probably never really liked them that much to begin with. But I do think the love for them can ebb and flow. Different priorities take over for a time and it can suck. But also there is more to life than just cool cars. Koichi was a prime example of this. I took five years off between the age of 19 and 24 where 
I didn't really spend a single dollar on cars. I didn't really even think about them at all outside of the occasional TJ Hunt or Dustin Williams video that might pop up in my YouTube feed. And now I can kind of say I'm glad I waited and took that break. When I was 16 years old, I told myself I will buy a fun and fast car the second I turn 20 years old and get my unrestricted license here in Australia. And when I turned 20, it was something I almost did, but I'm really glad that I didn't because I never would have had this life that I've built with my wife if I did. Anyway, my life aside, it's time to talk about some broom broom cars again. The Supra is built, it's insane, but Kay just can't keep up with what the car is now capable of. And during his race with Akio, the Supra itself can't keep up either, with the body starting to warp in the rear end. He still keeps pushing though until inevitably he backs off the throttle. Kay lost the heart to race because he finally realized he was just chasing his late father's dream, not his own. And he couldn't just race and die leaving his widowed mother behind. He asks Akio how long he intends to drive the Z and he responds by saying forever until the end, which just goes to cement even further how he wasn't cut out for this life. Nonetheless, he still has an appreciation for cars, just not risking his life racing at over 300 kilometers per hour on the Wangan. And after everything, the old gang fix up the Supra without him knowing, detune it to something dailyable, and surprise him with it to close off that story. Kay drives in memory of his late father. Why do you? To really drive Wangan Midnight's point home, we've got three more perspectives we've got to look at. And all of them are, once again, different shades of rebirth. Starting with Kuroki, a tuner who was once a member of a car club called R200 back in his younger years. And as everyone's age, the club has stayed together, but no one really races anymore, and he pretty much at this point calls them all sellouts. Because A, they don't really drive much anymore, and B, they only really ever work on cars for a dollar. They'll do it for money, they'll take anything they can get just to make a quick buck. The passion doesn't seem to be there anymore. Kuroki talks about how these guys used to push cars to their limits and race and have fun, but now it's just all about money. One of his mates tells him that's just life, and the first way a tuner like him would put himself out of business would be because he brought that destruction upon himself, in this case by being so selective about the cars he works on, and in a more general way, distancing himself from his customers. <coughs> Rumble Shack. <sighs> if you know, you know, that's a whole fucking Sydney-based rabbit hole to go down. Just like everyone else, Kuroki ends up entranced by the Z which right now is having some street tuning done. Akio is a little picky about it though, because he doesn't actually want to remove the car's carburetor or gain any extra power. His reasoning is that he's happy with how the car is performing now and doesn't want to change too much so that it would feel like a completely different car. But it's definitely not perfect and still needs something. Katami tells him he's probably going to fall behind on the Wangan if he continues down this path and tries to explain why by comparing him to Blackbird. Although right now, the Z is ahead, he explains that him and Tatsuya are equally fast, but have one key difference. Tatsuya treats the Blackbird like a machine that it is, which is his strength. Whereas Akio is too kind-hearted and puts his emotions into the Z, which Katami considers his strength, but also his biggest weakness. Because once you're so emotionally invested that you're scared you're gonna break the car, you're gonna hesitate when it matters most, which is some seriously appropriate foreshadowing for Kuroki. He finds that his R33 isn't fast enough to keep up with Blackbird, let alone the Z. So he completely overhauls it from the ground up, and in doing so, he beats Blackbird. But there's still a problem. The R33 is running hot. So hot, in fact, he almost overheats while stopping at a toll booth to pay it. Isn't that a wild concept to think about in 2024? Funnily enough, they actually do still have some manual cash toll booths in Japan. I even had to use one myself when I drove that R32 around Fuji like I mentioned back in my initial D video, and it felt really weird to do. Tangent aside, Kuroki notices the R33 can't shift into fifth gear, and he presumes that it's an engine mount issue, and once taking the engine out of the car, he realizes he was right. Which is absolutely insane, like god, I, I know a bit about cars, don't get me wrong, but man I wish I knew enough about cars to 
feel an issue like that while I was driving and then be able to self-diagnose that issue on the spot. Obviously the guy's been a tuner for 10 years, but still. I hear a squeak and I can't tell if it's coming from the front or the rear, let alone which part of the suspension is actually squeaking. Is it a control arm ball joint, an end link, a bushing? I don't fucking know. <laughs> so he fixes his 33, gets back with his ex that left him years ago all because of cars. She used to hate that part of him, but has actually come around to appreciate it over the years after dating other people. It's the whole thing. Also, side note, Tatsuya is absolutely gutted about his loss, which is an important point we'll come back to later because he actually is emotionally attached to the Porsche. And since losing to the 33, he feels like he can't trust the Blackbird anymore, subconsciously letting off the throttle every time he tries to race. Double side note, Akio finally chooses a tune setting for the car, which was the one that Reyna drove it in. While it seems unconventional on paper, it was the only tune that actually suited the way that the Z is built, to not be held back and to drive to the fullest. Akio was being conservative because he's emotionally attached, whereas Reyna helped him see the car in a different light, one that is fun to drive, which of course had a neat side effect of being faster than the factory settings. Sorry if this is getting a bit confusing, we follow a lot of different perspectives in this show and they're all really important to the show's themes and the point that I'm trying to build up to here. We get our race between the Z and the 33 and just like I was saying before, Kuroki's attachment to the car lost him the race. And he still pushed it too hard nonetheless because the engine blew. The key difference between these two and why Akio ended up winning is because he's learned to be content. If the car dies here, it dies. He's attached to the Z, but he knows how it was built to race. So he doesn't hold back. Whereas Kuroki just couldn't see all that hard work blow up into nothing. And fortunately, it doesn't because the 33 ends up being salvageable. What I love so much about Kuroki and this little arc here is that his rebirth actually ended up rekindling his old love. He got back together with his ex who now supports his passion. It just shows a different side to the coin where you don't have to give up and throw in the towel and move to the countryside after losing. You can get that passion back and keep it and have someone else love you all the more for it. Now our next flavor of rebirth is Guy who is too scared to leave his family business and go out, explore the world and live his dream. A classic and we kind of all know how this one goes. Eiji has always wanted to go to Tokyo and after a chance encounter with Tatsuya out in Osaka, he's decided him and his Evo are finally going to make that trip. But only for three months. He's not ready to leave behind his little brother and family business, so he says he'll come back. And contrary to how most of these stories go and what you'd expect from him by the end, he actually does go back. His arc is really short lived. Essentially, he moves to Tokyo, gets a part time job and starts racing. He ends up meeting some people from a tuna shop, RGO, and has his Evo built by the owner's daughter, Rikako. In the end, he's got a monster of an Evo that gets ahead of Blackbird and the Z. But unfortunately, it can't keep that lead because he refuses to use a tune setting that'll really open up the engine and give him some extra power for at least another 10 seconds before maybe some complications might happen. He considers using it after the Z passes him, but as soon as the Blackbird passes him too, he realizes he just doesn't have the heart to use it. He can't cut it as a pro driver because he does not want to risk his car. He knows if he uses that tune setting and he goes all out, there's a good chance something would break and he can't bear to destroy this beautiful motor that Ricardo built for him. If there's one rule to racing, it's that you're always free to decide whether you want to continue or to give up. And in this instance, he's done and he ends up moving back to Osaka. The race wasn't finished with him though, because for the first time in forever, the Blackbird finally passes the Z and took his mantle back as the king of the Wangan. This is an aspect of the show I haven't touched on much yet as I've really been delving into the characters and the themes here. But the rivalry between the Devil Z and Blackbird is one of the key pillars driving this plot forward. And it's one that extends to real life. Uh, I told you we'd come back to Midnight eventually. While a lot of what went on in Midnight is unknown and left up to speculation, like the newspaper adverts I mentioned earlier, some swear by them and others say they're just overhyped rumors. One thing we do know for certain is that the club contained a heavily modified Fair Lady Z 
and a heavily modified Porsche 911 Turbo, who did have their own little rivalry between each other. And this rivalry was the basis for Wangun Midnight's story. Right next to all the other characters and lenses we see this world through, this rivalry has got to be one of the most interesting parts of this story. Because while yes, these two are rivals, it is a really super unconventional rivalry because the two don't actually oppose each other in any way, shape or form. Akio and Tatsuya often meet up, casually race, talk, and even drive each other's cars. They're both continuously trying to prove each other as much as they are themselves and their own cars, mainly to keep the rivalry interesting as far as I'm concerned. And it accomplishes that job amazingly. There's never a moment in the series where I'm not wondering or just curious about what's happening with either the Z or the Blackbird, and you just can't help it but root for both of them. Their reason for driving is to continuously push themselves, each other, and their cars. And I think being the fastest on the Wangan isn't necessarily either of their goals, but just a byproduct of pushing each other in that way. Now we're entering the final chapter and go through the rebirth of the big mouth slugger, Kijima. He's the co-host on that midnight show Raina does, Drive Go Go, and has a pretty lengthy past in the racing scene. He used to drive an FC RX-7 that he would work on with his buddies and race Time Attack at Scuba with. But he left all that behind years ago until he got that itch. Akio feels like something's kind of up with the Z, so he wants to get an outside perspective and who better than this new guy on the scene, Kijima. So he drives it, and when he does, he is absolutely Booked. The Devil Z has entranced yet another soul, and he goes out on a journey to find his old FC and rekindle that flame again. Along the way, he meets up with his old friend Machida and tells him he feels like he's turning back into the person that he was years ago after driving that Z, and tells him he wants to race again and that he should come back and you know, help him tune the car if he finds it, but he gets hit with a reality check. Machida lays down some hard truths, telling him that he doesn't have the luxury to go back to this racing world like he does. Kijima is a decently successful TV host with literally nothing to tie him down. But Machida has a new life now, he's settled down, he has a daughter to worry about. Being out of the game for over five years was quite a long time and now he doesn't see himself ever getting back into the world of tuning. Luckily enough though, the visit wasn't in vain as he has heard a rumour about where the old FC might be. And so we get a heartfelt reunion between man and car he regrets selling, which is a moment, unfortunately, I'll never get to experience. Because the guy I sold my Hawkeye to, unfortunately, crashed it within five days of taking ownership. What can you do? As we approach our final race, all of our cars essentially go through their own little shonen training arc. Tatsuya gets in a minor accident that ends up needing the Blackbird to be basically rebuilt from the ground up because of chassis damage, and he decides it's time for a weight reduction anyway, so he switches everything out to carbon fibre panels. Akio wants a fresh set of eyes on the Z because something doesn't feel quite right, so he gets Rikako to rebuild it because of how great of a job she did on the Evo. This is also where we find out there's pretty much nothing actually special about this Z. It was completely rebuilt each and every time by Kitami, just straight up using OEM Nissan parts. But he did mention one thing he never touched, which was the crankshaft. Only for Rikako to find there is a slight one millimeter difference in length, which supposedly makes all the difference for why the Z is so special. It's, it's an anime, we'll let him have this. <laughs> and finally, we have Kijima, who is going through a midlife crisis, realizing he's got nothing to lose. If he dies today, all his money and his accomplishments at his job get left behind. He can't take that with him. And all of it's artificial anyway, so who cares about that? He sure doesn't. So why not fucking race, which is exactly what he does. All three cars are finally ready, and it's time for one final showdown on the Wangan, where despite all of their efforts, Tatsuya and Kijima lose out to the Devil Z, because Akio doesn't hesitate. He's overcome every single mental barrier and pushes forward with the Z, whereas both Tatsuya and Kijima admit to being afraid. It's understandable for Kijima, he's 
older, stopped racing for quite a while and just got back into the scene so he can satisfy an old craving. But for Tatsuya, being scared is something new. Part of it was because the weight reduction he did made him feel less grounded in his car. So accelerating felt risky, but another part of it was all in his own head. For the first time, he couldn't stay calm during a race. He's finally realized and admits to himself that he wishes he was the one chosen by the Z. It frustrates him and the only thing worse is someone else being chosen by that Z and performing better than he ever could in it. So the only option he has now is to face it head on and race until he can finally beat it again, which is his new reason to drive. <sighs> what a series. It is a shame it ends here because it really feels like we're on the cusp of resolving Tatsuya and Akio's rivalry, as well as really getting to the resolution of each of their character arcs. But unfortunately, this is the point where we part ways with our cast. That is, unless you can read Japanese. Because Wanga Midnight does continue on in the manga, but unfortunately, a vast majority of it is left untranslated. That's right, we've technically only seen the tip of the iceberg in this anime as the manga has 550 chapters and what's been translated into the anime is roughly around half of that. But again, not much is translated. At this point, only 173 chapters have been translated and Teisoku scans, who were working so hard on getting that much done, have unfortunately dropped it as of about a year ago. So as of right now, nobody's working on translations. At this point, we can only hope someone else will pick up the pieces, but it is a really tall order to ask someone to translate the remaining 377 chapters of this manga. But who knows? Maybe someone in Japan who likes cars and speaks English could give us a YouTube video of like a summary recapping the events that happens in the rest of this manga. Maybe someone like Masa from Dustin Williams vlogs if he's happened to have read all of One Khan Midnight. But now we've come to the big question. What in the hell have I been building up to this entire video? And why have I continuously asked you why you drive like some brainwashing Simpsons join the Navy advert? Well, it's honestly kind of simple. I just wanted to know. By now, you should realize that finding your reason to drive and reigniting that passion for cars is a key pillar of Wanga Midnight's story and its characters, and it's easily the most interesting part of the show. So I wanted you to really think about that and think about why you drive in a similar fashion to how it's explored with our cast. Then you can leave your stories in the comments and not only I, but every single other person that watches this video can read them as if they are your own Wangan Midnight character arc. Hell, I already kind of did the same thing earlier in this video myself. But you might be asking yourself, why does this guy, me, why do I drive? I've yapped on for nearly an hour about all of these characters and tried to make you look introspectively upon yourself and why you drive, but why do I? I think it boils down to a lot of things. Like a lot of people, I drive for the thrill of it, the adrenaline rush, that smell of gasoline, the way everything else fades away from your brain as the wind hits you. But then there's also the social aspect of it. I love hanging out with my friends and just talking about cars. I literally spent a whole day doing that just the other day when my mate came over to help me replace my ISF's lower control arm bushings. And it's not just something you can talk to anyone about because not everyone's into the same things you are on the same level that you are. So when you do find other car enthusiasts you can chat shit with, keep them close. My initial D video ended up being a video about how it doesn't matter what you drive. And in the same vein, this video on One Gun Midnight ended up exploring more about why you drive. With everything being said though, you don't need some crazy nuanced reason to drive. It doesn't need to be that deep, we aren't all characters in some anime. But at the same time, I think car enthusiasts are sometimes lumped into this group of meatheads who only really care about car go fast. And while some of that can be true, it's good to sometimes take a step back think about what all this is for and why we do it in the first place. More than any of that though, what I really think I've been building up this whole video for, what I've really been trying to say this entire time, my main reason to drive 